Again, thank you all for joining us. We will be starting within the next few minutes. I'll chime in, Michelle, if you uh, saw the comment that just came in the chat. Anna, we're so happy to have you tonight. All right, hello everyone. Go ahead and get comfortable. And thank you for joining us tonight for our History Happy Hour. Tonight our subject is Women's Roller Derby. My name is John Kennedy, and I am the Specialist of Education and Engagement at the Indiana Historical Society. It is great to have so many of you here this evening, and I hope you're having a very pleasant St. Patrick's Day. I will be going over a few details before passing the mic over to our speakers. At the Indiana Historical Society, we are Indiana Storyteller, connecting people to the past. We collect paper-based items such as books, paintings, letters, photographs, diaries, and more to tell Indiana's unique stories. We then find ways to share these stories through publications, exhibits, and events such as this one. Through these documents, we tell the diverse stories of Indiana and inspire a future grounded in our state's uniting values and principles. Tonight, we're going to learn about the subject of roller derby with our guest, Dr. Michelle Marino. Uh, Dr. Marino is the Deputy Director of the Indiana Historical Bureau, a division of the Indiana State Library. She is a trained oral historian who oversees numerous projects for the Indiana Historical Bureau and is a former member of Pioneer Valley Roller Derby in Western Massachusetts. She is here to discuss the sport as well as her book entitled Roller Derby, now available at the University of Texas Press. It is a pleasure to have you here with us tonight. Uh, and we are also joined by our moderator, uh, Bethany Rachevic, our, our Director of Education and Engagement here at Indiana Historical Society. Thank you for joining us, Bethany. Thanks, I'm happy to be here tonight. And thank to you, our viewers, for joining us. Uh, here is how tonight's program will go. For our event, Bethany and our guests will talk for about 35 minutes and then we'll open it up to your questions. If you have questions as we go along, please drop them in the question, question and answer section on uh, the bottom of your Zoom screen. We'll keep an eye on them throughout the show and then we'll pepper them in as we get to the second half of our program. If you'd like to add anything to the chat box, don't forget to change your response to all panelists and attendees so that we can see all of your thoughts. Keep an eye on the chat because I will be dropping in links and URLs throughout the conversation. Don't worry if you miss one, they will be delivered to your inbox in a follow-up email tomorrow morning. This program is being recorded and you can catch the replay on our website, indianahistory.org, in the upcoming weeks. If you enjoyed this program, please consider coming back for more. Our next History Happy Hour is on April 7th, where we talk with Emilio Aguilar. We will be discussing the Hispanic influence on Northern Indiana, including their impact on the politics of the city of East Chicago. Our host, our moderator for that night will be Nicole Martinez Legrand, our Multicultural Collections Coordinator here at the Indiana Historical Society. You can sign up for that program and more over at indianahistory.org. You can find out more information about this program and our other virtual offerings coming through 2022. All right, take it away, Bethany. Thank you so much, John. Michelle, it's so lovely to have you here tonight. Thank you again for joining us. You're welcome. I'm thrilled to be here. And John, my apologies. I totally botched that intro. You clearly led me into it and I just didn't say anything. So that's on me. I'm super excited to be here. All right. <laughs> so Michelle, I want to start off. First, your book is amazing. I highly recommend it to everyone. Um, I learned so much from it. And so I'm glad that we're able to talk about it more tonight. Uh, so the first question I had as I was reading through the book was about you. How did you get interested in researching roller derby of all things? And, and how did that interest lead to you writing the book? Yeah, so really, <laughs> that's a very long drawn out story, but um, I grew up here in Indiana in Shelby County, just about 25 miles southeast here of Indianapolis. And um, as any good Hoosier knows, we are a sports state through and through, basketball mainly. And so, of course, I grew up playing all sorts of sports, but basketball was king in our household or queen rather, if you will. 
Um, and I played a couple years in college, um, just was always looking to continue playing sports. Um, but the older I got, which is pretty old now, um, there's less and less opportunity to play competitive sports. Um, but I also have always been interested, really, um, since I'm in high school, also researching um, women's sports in particular, particularly the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League has always been an interest of mine. Um, but when I was heading into my doctoral program at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, um, I knew that I wanted to research basketball for my dissertation. Um, and so I was having a meeting with my advisor, Chris Oppie, um, and he sort of threw out this idea of, you know, maybe you should have some sort of comparative sport. You've got basketball, this very traditional sport. What if you looked at something that wasn't so traditional? And I very distinctly remember this moment where he's like, what about roller derby? And I'm like, what about it? And I really didn't have any frame of reference and didn't really know much about it. I had these like very vague images of like seeing it on cable TV in the late 1990s, like, like on after American gladiators. And it was very like kind of hokey and um, they're on rollerblades and it was very much spectacle. That was really all I knew about roller derby. But he, you know, elaborate a little bit, like there's been a resurgence of it, but there's a long history to it. Like, why don't you just look into it? And I'm like, uh, okay, I guess. Um, but I did, I started researching it. And like, the more I kept learning about it, the more I was like, this is amazing. This has such a rich history. It's been around for, forever. It's got all these really interesting gender dynamics that I just didn't know about. And it really worked well as a comparison um, and looking at the very traditional sport, which had long been a women's sport in some ways um, for basketball. So that's how I began researching it. And I researched it for about a year before I was like, maybe I should try playing. And maybe I could understand the sport better if I tried my own hand at it. But um, to kind of sum up the answer to that question. So I started researching it, started playing it. And then uh, my dissertation, which was called Sweating Femininity, um, and some other long title that has long since been forgotten. Um, so it was a comparison between basketball and roller derby. And then when I began teaching a few years later, um, when I finished my degree, I decided to turn the roller derby portion of my dissertation into a full length manuscript. I love that. And I love that you took your interest all the way to actually being a part of the roller derby community and playing it as well. I mean, I'm sure you would have with basketball <laughs> had you decided to write a book about women's basketball, mm -hmm. but um, I, I love that you took that next step with your research. Yeah, and that was, for me, that was a really important step, and I don't actually think I could have completed the project if I had not done that, and I do want to point out a difference, though, that when I started playing roller derby, it was not to be like covert participant, like underground, hidden, you know, I'm not telling anybody I'm working on this project or researching it to like, you know, reveal or uncover all these like dynamics. It was more like, I let everybody know, you know, I'm also researching the history of the game, but I want to understand it. I want to know what players would have dealt with. Um, I didn't also know how to skate really. I'd only skated at like a birthday party in the eighth grade. So it's not like I, you know, already had the skill set behind me and now, um, you know, wanted to play. So, but I, you know, it, it obviously helped me understand the game better. It put me into, or I tapped into a network of both uh, skaters of the modern game, but then also um, a lot of leagues had connections to skaters that had skated um, you know, in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. So it put me in touch with a lot of people um, that I later interviewed um, for the book or for the larger project. And so that was really useful um, as well and gave me perspective to understand what had been with the historic game and what the modern game uh, looked like now and what, you know, were the carryovers for that and what were the differences. Yeah, so so I know some of our audience will be familiar with the history of roller derby. Um, and, and you've mentioned that it's been around for a long time, but for those mm -hmm. who may not be as familiar with the history of the sport, I understand that it, it started out as a leisure activity in the 1800s. So how does it go from early origins as a hobby to a full-fledged sport that we might see on TV? Right. So roller skating has been around for a really long time. Um, you know, there's sort of conflicting stories about 
when roller skating was invented and who invented it. But in short, like that has been around since post-Civil War era and it was a relatively cheap activity. People would buy these uh, clamp-on skates that you would just literally clamp on to your shoes and you could skate outside on the sidewalks or, you know, roller skating rinks would sort of go through these boom and bust cycles of popularity from the, you know, late 19th century, really through the entire 20th century too. Um, and of course, if people are roller skating, they're gonna find a way to make that competitive as well. Um, and so from that, you would have races that developed and um, you know, competition skating, speed skating, that sort of thing. And then eventually, um, really in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, you would start to see like roller marathons being held where you know, they'd, they'd skate for these really long distances um, and have various races like within that. Um, but roller derby as we understand it today um, really wasn't developed or called roller derby as such officially um, until, uh, let's see, uh, the 1930s. So Leo Seltzer, um, I see you're showing some of the, the early pictures from, at that point was called the Transcontinental Roller Derby. So Leo Seltzer was an entertainment promoter, um, entertainment businessman, um, and in the 1930s, uh, in the late 1920s and into the early 1930s, um, was he had put on a series of like walkathons, danceathons, these type of like cheap entertainment um, events that um, you know anyone could go to, anyone could participate in, um, and had some success with them. But was like people aren't going to keep coming back to see this, and so he claims to have invented this idea from scratch. Uh, for this early transcontinental roller derby, which was not really true. <laughs> there had been plenty of roller derbies in the past couple of decades, but what he does, which is brilliant, is he trademarks the name roller derby, so nobody else can ever hold another one and call it as such. So he doesn't really invent the sport from scratch. It was just sort of a conglomeration of a bunch of different activities that had been going on for decades, but where he really... Um, I guess plays a major role. One is trademarking the name, good moves. Um, but two, uh, in 1937, after a couple years of what was essentially a roller marathon, and I'll explain what that means in just a second, they um, have contact. And so it evolves into a team sport where like hitting is allowed. Um, there's a point scoring system. Um, and that evolves into sort of the modern game that, that we understand and know today. But the first couple years, um, when the sport started. Um, it was, again, transcontinental roller derby. And the way it was set up was there would be pairs of skaters, a male and a female, they'd be on the same team, and they would skate for a month straight. <laughs> so the point was um, to skate essentially was somewhere between three and 4,000 miles. And there would be a lit map behind the track. Um, and they would sort of track progress of the pairs uh, skating from, say, like New York or Chicago to uh, a, a point in California. And so the first uh, couple to, um, you know, complete that 3,000, 3,500, 4,000 mile trek won the roller derby. So again, it started as this roller marathon and then evolves from that into the more modern game. So you mentioned this, this contact element of the sport that also was there. I, was it kind of like a chicken and egg situation? I mean, did did the sport evolve to be contact and the audience loved that and helped it grow? Or, or did the audience kind of encourage that of the players? It kind of depends on who you ask with that too, of course, right? Um, but Seltzer liked to sometimes sort of create this sort of origin story of roller derby. And this is where he claims that he and Damon Runyon, who was a famous playwright in the 20th century of, uh, of dyes and dolls fame, um, that they are watching a roller derby, uh, a transcontinental roller derby and um, in Coral Gable, Gables, Florida. And I think it was late 1937 or early 1938. And essentially um, some of the skaters start jostling on the track and the fans like go wild, but the referees stop it. Um, and, you know, Damon, um, Runyon and Seltzer are just like, we should, we should like explore this. Like, obviously this was great. Everyone's getting riled up. And so apparently they go 
uh, to dinner and like write out the new rules of this game, right? Um, in reality, I think there had always been a little bit of that. And yes, they understood that that was drawing in crowds and really probably seltzers like, how long can I do the roller marathon? Like, is this going to last forever? Kind of like the walkathons and, and stuff. So it's sort of this natural evolution of um, gauging what the crowd wanted and what the skaters wanted to do and sort of evolve into this more competitive sport. So I don't know if I can say definitively one way or the other, but they absolutely were mutually in, influential because um, if you um, look at some of the interviews with like early skaters, they'll be like, yes, it was a sport and yes, um, I wanted to win and I played hard, but they would throw theatrics in there to get the crowd riled up. It was still a business organization that had to make money and you got to put butts in the seats essentially. So, um, you know, those things definitely played off of each other. Yeah. And seltzer, like a true business owner and entrepreneur trying to get people in. I mean, smart guy to capitalize on what was selling at the time. <laughs> For sure. And he always really struggled with his sort of vision of the sport because he really did want it to be a true sport. And he, there's lots of quotes for him where he would say like, no, this is um, legitimate, you know, we are not staging anything. We're not rigging this. I want it to be a true sport. But then he would also say, well, I'm not the AAU. I'm not uh, the NCAA or, or whatever it was. And I can sort of change things on a whim. I can sort of do whatever I want with it. Um, and he wanted it to be taken seriously. And sort of treated like, again, you know, other official sporting organizations, but he was always a small organization and it wasn't something that people are just playing at school. There's not a high school roller derby team. So he always had to find a way to bring people in and to get crowds in. So a lot of times that would sort of force the organization for better or worse to sort of walk that tight line or skate that thin line of being entertainment um, and, and spectacle or being true sport. And I'm sure we'll get more into that here as we go. Yeah. Um, so the picture that John just had up about the Miss America uh, kind of pageantry there, was that one of the things that Seltzer also brought in um, as a way to continue trying to reinvent and, and keep people in? So partly that too also evolved over the years. Um, and this was something that other sports did at the time, um, which isn't necessarily always talked about, but so roller derby, I guess I haven't really mentioned um, yet, but this is a very important point to make was co-ed from it, its beginning. So from 1935, there were male and female skaters um, and they were on the same team even. Um, and so the fact that women, particularly after 1935, but even before that, when they're competing this very intense, like grueling marathon sport, like that's a very hard thing to do, right? And then once they add contact, this is not seen as being like ladies tennis, you know, middle class over tea and whatever sandwiches. I don't, I don't know what they do, but um, it, it's it's rough. It's a full contact sport. And so that, um, led the media and some fans who also were very drawn to that, but to be like, who are these women? Why are they so rough? And there's all sorts of connotations that go along with that, right? Um, and so one way that Seltzer um, is trying to present to the skaters is, yes, they're fun to watch. Yes, this is an action-packed sport, um, but because they're sort of transgressing into this, what is typically a masculine sports realm, they are having to apologize for that behavior. Uh, there's a sociologist named Jan Felshen who has coined this term apologetic behavior, that they then need to apologize for that by sort of doubling down on their femininity, right? So these pageants or beauty queens or queen and king contests that they would have in the roller derby were a way for them to say, no, she is just like any other woman, look how pretty she is, look how dainty she is when she's not in her skates. Um, and so it was a way for them to sort of play up that normalcy piece and, and play into really white middle class heteronormative ideals that were sort of the standard um, of the time. Yeah, so, so do you think these um, derby pageants, were they reinforcing or fighting back against societal views of, of beauty and femininity and societal roles of what women should do at that time? <laughs> Both, <laughs> which makes it complicated. Of course it does, right? Um, but like, 
you know, in short, they are, you know, how do I want to say this? They are sexualizing the female athletes. They're playing on their femininity, playing on their beauty as this important aspect um, of them. On the other hand, though, when they're on the track, they're treated equally as the male skaters. They're actually paid more in many instances than the male skaters. Um, they are encouraged to be rough. They are encouraged to fight. They are encouraged to, you know, fully, um, you know, play into their athletic identity. So they're balancing these things. Conversely, the roller derby also has a king contest. So it's not just the women that are engaging in this. It's actually the men too, which is a really interesting facet as well, because they're not doing it for the men for the same reasons they're doing it for the women. Um, because men and women are skating together um, on the track, um, they're having to sort of apologize for the women doing this, right? But they're having to build up the, the man who is being sort of feminized because he's skating with women. So it's a little bit more complicated than that to unpack. But in short, um, they're both engaging in these patterns or in these pageants or king and queen contest, but for different reasons. What was what was interesting for me as I was reading your book was was that recognition that it was co-ed from the start, mm -hmm. but there seemed to be such a strong female following in the audience and then the support for budding female athletes. Mm -hmm. What was it about roller derby that was so appealing, not just for these upcoming female athletes, mm -hmm. but also for the female audience? Right. Um, so Seltzer talks a lot about that, both Leo Seltzer, who sort of founded the sport, um, and then also um, his son, Jerry Seltzer, who takes over in the late 1950s. Um, but on one hand, Leo Seltzer like consciously recognizes that the female market is not being tapped properly for sporting events and that they can relate to roller derby in ways that they can't say a football game. Women are playing football. They're not allowed. They've never done it in school. So, you know, I might go to a football game, but I'm not going to relate to the players in the same way, whereas the average woman can with roller derby because one, um, it's something that really anybody can pick up and then play. Um, it's not like you had to, again, have played all through school and then gone to college to be a roller derby star, right? Like they're just picking up people from lo local rinks and then training them to do this sport. So, and it's not one ideal body type historically and then even in the modern game too um, that, that succeeds at roller derby. The first real gate attraction is a 40 year old diabetic woman named Ma Bogash who brings her son with her to like join the roller derby. So it's like, this appeals to everybody, right? So he consciously sells tickets um, in markets to female fans to bring them in. Um, and then he also knows that roller derby sort of gets them riled up in ways that um, other sports don't. Um, and that they're like sort of active participants um, in, in sort of performing gender um, in the crowd as well. So again, that's sort of a conscious decision that, that he's making um, not only to, you know, have women um, skate in the roller derby, but then also as fans. Um, but then Jerry Seltzer was sort of famous for saying too, like that he really felt like the roller derby provided this outlet for women who, if they didn't go to the roller derby once a month, were going to go home and like murder their husbands. Like they just had all this pent up aggression and rage. And when they came to the roller derby, they could just sort of let that out in sort of middle class spaces that they like couldn't do if they're just going to like a basketball game or a tennis match or whatever else it is that this provided that um, the, the outlet for skaters, but then this outlet for the female fan as well almost like the societally approved way <laughs> right. out of repression. Right. And then you just go home and continue on with your day. But when you're at the roller derby, you're throwing things on the track and yelling and whatever else. And just don't talk about time. what you do at the track. <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> um, so you mentioned a really interesting thing that this all kind of started with a 40 year old woman skating with her son. So yeah. it seems like family is is an important part, even from the foundation of the sport. Can you talk a little bit about the role of, of family, you know, through the, through the history of the sport, but then, you know, I read 
not only in your book, but I had heard about these things called diaper derbies. Mm-hmm. So how, how did family evolve throughout the history? Right. So roller derby really is a family affair from the outset. So like it, the Seltzer family um, really, again, gets the sort of modern version of it going. Um, but Leo Seltzer starts it. Um, he He's working in tandem with his brother, Oscar, who owns a skate company that is like connected to the roller derby. Um, once his kids get a little bit older, well, he always he takes his kids to the games, too. Um, but when they get a little bit older, he has his daughter working in the front office. Her husband is like a referee or in management. Then Jerry Seltzer, his son, takes over at one point. So, of course, the Seltzer family is sort of interwoven throughout um, the official roller derby organization as well. But then you have all sorts of brothers and sisters that join. Um, I'm doing some research right now over at the Historical Bureau, too, on just Indiana connections to roller derby, of which there are actually um, several. But there was a, a famous skating family here from Indianapolis, the Kemp's. Montagene Kemp skated, um, came out of Short Ridge High School in the 1940s. Her sister Georgiana follows, her brother Buddy follows. Um, there's multiple brother sister units, and then there becomes a lot of intermarriage in the roller derby, too. And what was is really sort of revolutionary about the roller derby, and I think more than anything else, I mean, obviously, I think it's important to tell the, the story of roller derby and the history and sort of in this academic way. There's been a lot of popular histories about it as well, but um, is the way that the roller derby, the Seltzer family allowed women to be athletes and mothers and didn't make them choose to inhabit multiple identities and in ways that really no other sport in the 20th century does. And I would argue that even today it doesn't happen. So um, very early on in the roller derby, um, <laughs> Seltzer knew how important his female skaters were and was kind of afraid of losing them to marriage or having kids. And so he tried to prevent skaters from dating each other which is just, that's not going to end well, right? So like he realizes that that's a futile effort um, and then begins encouraging it because he'd rather skaters stay together within their sort of family organization as opposed to get married and leave and settle down and not continue to, to travel. And what is really, in some ways, a very difficult lifestyle. Um, so then you start to see skaters marrying each other, divorcing each other, marrying other skaters amongst each other. Um, And as Danny notes in the comments, yeah, getting pregnant was an issue for the skaters, but it didn't mean that their career was over. That is where roller derby, again, is different than anything else. You brought your kids with you um, or you left them with family and then you traveled for a bit and came back. There were different options you sort of had, but it did not mean that once you had kids or once you got married, you could not continue with the roller derby. They made it work. They would send um, babysitters out um, at the you know next town that they were traveling to, make sure that there were babysitters there. Uh, they would send advancement out, make sure that the hotel rooms had cribs, um, whatever else they needed. They would have roller derby trainees travel with the families until they were ready to skate. They would just watch the kids. Um, and so then I'm getting a bit long-winded, but you asked about the diaper derbies. Another way to sort of put the shine on the roller derby institution that no, these aren't rough and tumble athletes. These aren't sort of crazy people playing this sport. They're, they're just like you. Look at these families. Look at these kids. Look at these mothers. They're, they're just like us. It's a way to show that, no, this is a family entertainment um, and, and that families were involved. I love just the evolution of community throughout all mm-hmm. of it. And this, and this, this strong emphasis within the sport of whether it's, no, you can't, you can't marry each other, but actually, no, we're going to double down on this and please stay within our community because we want to make this community stronger. There seems to be that common theme of finding what can be done to help the community be a stronger community together. Yeah. And, and that's true. I mean, I think some of this, like the, the business, like the business decision was promote pushing Seltzer to do this. On the other hand, though, he also um, said multiple times, like, women are the better athletes. Women are the stronger athletes than men. And so, like, he knew that they could do this and and the value, but to keep them there, you had to accommodate, again, these multiple roles that that all women um, inhabit. So, yeah, he he understood that, and maybe not right away, but um, over time. And then, 
uh, both he and his son, Jerry, like made conscious decisions that they would never like separate a husband and wife, you know, after they had gotten married. And so it created all these other interesting team dynamics about like trades and, and who was going to skate where and, and past relationships and how that would affect things um, too. So. Yeah. So even with this and, and then throughout the book, you, you talk a lot about the complexities of, of identity and, and gender identity as well. How did kind of this question of balancing femininity, athleticism, social standards, your role as a mother and as an athlete, how did that impact the growth of roller derby in the country? Were, was the public on board with, with this complexity of identity and how did they grapple with some of that? Like, I feel like every question I've said, all of the above, yes and no, and it's complicated, right? But but it is. Um, so like on one hand, again, the roller derby made it work, embraced women's multiple identities. And I think that that endeared it to a large segment of the population who, who saw that and, and respected it and just loved watching women skate or, or the roller derby itself, right? Um, on the other hand, um, it really made a lot of like diehard traditional sports fans, as well as the mainstream sports media question, like, what is this? Women are skating, they're bringing their kids with them. Um, it, it's a measure of spectacle. There's a lot of fights and other things too. Like, this can't be legitimate. This can't be on the same par as Major League Baseball um, or, or anything else, right? So um, on one hand, I think, again, it was sort of revolutionary and like push the bar in terms of what sports could look like and could be. On the other hand, because of that, um, you know, people didn't always accept it um, because of the spectacle, because of just women being involved um, and the the sort of barnstorming nature of the, the sport um, historically, too. I think it just um, made people question it in ways that the other sports, even women's sports, didn't necessarily um, get. Yeah, so throughout all of this, you've painted the picture of a really strong, culturally significant sport through the early and mid 1900s. We start to see, or at least I noticed a decline that you noticed in the, uh, that you wrote about in the book in you know the 1970s. And it really seemed to kind of drop off the map before its resurgence in the 90s and 2000s. What happened to lead to the, the the fall of the sport and then its resurgence again? Yeah, so several things, of course. Um, but one is that roller derby sort of heyday, its peak occurs from the late 1940s to the mid 1950s when they are based out of New York. And it becomes very popular during that time period. Uh, Leo Seltzer has a TV contract where essentially roller derby is on TV every day for like three years straight. There's no off season. They don't take any breaks. Um, and it becomes very popular. And that's sort of the golden era of the sport, right? But essentially what they do is over, oversaturate the market. People get sort of tired of it and um, they lose their contract and can't find another one. And so there's sort of a, a couple year lull there where they're not sure what to do or how they're going to continue on. Um, and so they actually shift over to the West Coast and then um, pick back up again in sort of the mid to late 1950s um, out of San Francisco beca becomes the hub or the Bay Area there. And what happens then is Leo Seltzer gets out of the sport and his son Jerry takes over. And Jerry recognizes that we can't do the same thing that we have done in the past. And he makes several really important changes. One is he um, makes a portable track. So no, they can, and it's smaller now. So they can set up in like smaller arenas and move from city to city. He also makes a couple other important changes related to TV syndication, the way we're now watching TV changes. Um, and so what he would do was send out tapes of roller derby games that had already been recorded. And he would, and it didn't really matter because roller derby, um, it didn't play like a traditional season like other sports. And it really didn't matter who won per se. It was about watching the game and enjoying it and having fun. Um, and so he would just send out these tapes. And again, it doesn't matter who wins. It doesn't matter what order you, you show them or play them um, to sort of in, to gauge interest in the sport in any particular area. And if so many fans would write back about, oh, we loved watching the roller derby, they would then go play in that location. 
So he sort of changes the model of how they travel around and, and what they do. Um, and he has some success with that for, for really about a decade. And then um, several things happen at the same time. Um, one is in the early 1970s, there's the gas oil crisis. And roller derby is an institution that moves around and travels all the, all the time. So that is um, problematic um, just in terms of cost, right, for what is a business organization. Um, and a lot of the uh, places that they would play, their cost would go up. And so they couldn't afford to have like so many events at their stadiums, essentially. So that caused a problem. And the other thing that had happened that I haven't talked about too much is a competing organization best known by um, the name Roller Games, because I can't say Roller Derby, right, um, was a group of skaters that had previously been with the Roller Derby. And this happened so many times throughout the Seltzer organization where they'd be mad about money or pay or whatever, and would break off and form their own sort of Roller Derby. Um, but most of them didn't last. They'd have a successful series here or there, and they'd come back to the Seltzer organization. But Roller Games stuck. Um, and it also is operating out of uh, California, but then spreads across the country too. Roller Games was way more theatrical than Roller Derby was and had a greater level of spectacle, um, again, than Roller Derby did. And Roller Derby feels like it has to keep up with Roller Games. And so they then begin engaging in Again, not staging games necessarily or picking who wins, but staged fights, um, you know, more silly antics than they had had previously. And they sort of tarnished their own reputation there towards the end. Um, so uh, anyways, uh, that competition sort of heats up and essentially it just comes a moment where Jerry Seltzer says, we just can't go on. We don't have the funds to do it. There's all these sort of other factors going on. Uh, they've lost some of their TV contracts. And so they end up folding in mid-1973. Roller, um, der roller Games, I'm sorry, limps along for another couple of years um, and then they too fold. And so Roller Derby really dies down. Therefore, you have a couple units or leagues that pop up here, there, but in the, like the Roller Jam one that I mentioned that I had seen on TNN or TNT or something in the late 90s. But you really don't have the sort of lasting power of the Seltzer organization or Roller Games um, until the modern resurgence after 2001. And I'm super sorry, my dog is going crazy. I don't know if you can all hear that. <laughs> Mine has been suspiciously quiet, so. <laughs> I don't know which is worse. <laughs> um Friends, we are about five-ish minutes away before I'll turn to some of your questions. You've got some great ones coming in, so keep those coming. I'm excited to be able to turn to those. But I've got one final one before I do that, Michelle. Roller Derby is, is back in pop culture. We, we see it. We have some of our Roller Derby friends with us tonight. How is Roller Derby today? different than the sport of the heyday in in kind of that 1930s to 50s yeah so um modern modern today's roller derby uh, emerges in the early 2000s and kind of out of austin texas actually and um what is interesting is that when it started it was kind of out of the bar scene in texas and i don't need to necessarily go into all that history but when they first started they didn't really know that much about the historic game. Um, and so they were sort of winging it and, and creating it on their own. And for the first year or two, they also were drawing on a lot of that spectacle. And this is where you see like uh, derby names uh, come about, the sort of alter ego, but they were also mixed in with this sort of do it yourself ethic, punk rock ethic, riot girls, this sort of, uh, again, cultural scene. Um, but there was an early split in the leagues that started in the early 2000s, um, where they then become, it is an amateur sport, but a serious sport. None of the clotheslining, none of the a spectacle, this is for real, we're, we're playing. And, and, but they're using the old rules of the past, really, they're very, very similar in terms of the structure of the game and how it's played. So um, a few of the differences though to highlight is the historic game, by and large was played on a banked track, um, which made uh, things faster, but also more dangerous <laughs> too, or dangerous in different ways, I should say. Um, and again, it was co-ed 
the, the older game was co-ed in the sense that men and women were on the same team. They didn't always skate together on the track at the same time. Sometimes they would, but not always. Um, but so the women would skate for a period and then the men would skate and the score was cumulative. So again, they were again, literally on the same team. Uh, but the modern version that emerged was very much um, feminist, uh, again, do it yourself ethic. Um, and we're very leery of men's participation, I would really say through the first five years, but really probably 10 years. However, since then, there have been some men's leagues that have popped up, um, but by and large, the modern version is, um, say women's roller derby, but they are more inclusive than just women. Um, and so that may be a thing that we talk about here in, in the question and answer in the chat here in just a second. Um, but the league that I skated with in Western Massachusetts was actually a co-ed league. So when I was studying the sport, like that wasn't weird to me because that was also the experience I was having, but that's not the experience of most modern um, roller derby uh, leagues that tend to be um, women only. But again, that has changed um, and are much more inclusive um, of you know non-binary skaters and transgender skaters and everything too. So that is a good push in the right direction there as well. Um, but in terms of the rules and things, the structure of the game is by and large very similar to the rule set from the Seltzer family too. Yeah. Well, Michelle, we've got some great questions that have come in. And so I'll, I'll kick it off with one from Danny. Uh, was roller derby segregated or was there diversity in the early stages of the sport? Yeah, that's a great question. So it was never officially segregated, but of course it was. Um, but they did, the Seltzer family actually was um, pretty inclusive generally of who was in the, the roller derby. Um, and like they didn't officially bar um, African-Americans or other groups of people. But again, there, there were not any right way in the early sport. However, um, it did uh, integrate earlier than most of the mainstream sports, not as early as say Major League Baseball. Um, but the first black skater was a guy by the name of Maurice Plumer, um, who I believe joined in 1953. He is often left out of the record because he didn't develop into a star skater. Um, but within a year or two, several other black skaters joined. And you do see this in the black newspapers too, that they were very glad that more um, black people were being included um, within the roller derby. And there are several sort of like really important moments within the roller derby where they were skating in the South and um, the black skaters were discriminated against and they like refused to go into you know, the auditoriums or stay in particular hotels. Um, so they were, very welcoming of black skaters um, in the early 1950s. A lot of the black skaters themselves would talk about that they didn't feel discriminated against and they felt supported within the roller derby family. Um, so I, again, feel like they're more progressive than most sports, but not to say that things were perfect because they certainly were not. I also will say that um, roller derby was way more inclusive of LGBTQ skaters decades before other sports were. Um, they had a sort of don't ask, don't tell policy, which of course is problematic in itself. Um, but there were lots of gay female and male skaters that skated very early on and skated and were open internally um, amongst the skaters themselves. It was not something that the roller derby marketed per se, um, but like Sugar Ray Robinson, the famous boxer, his son skated, Ronnie Robert Robinson, um, who was openly gay. Um, and so there, there's a lot of stories like that where internally they know that and there's no issues there at all. Um, but externally, again, it wasn't something that the roller derby marketed because they're trying to, um, again, sort of paint themselves in this particular way. So that's great. Um, so you've mentioned not only yourself watching roller derby on TV, we've got a question from Anna about the history of roller derby being broadcast versus having it in person with spectators, particularly with the transcontinental era, but I'll, I'll broaden that. Has roller derby always been broadcast or, or how did you do, how did they do that when it was a marathon for a month? Yeah, so it wasn't, the, the first broadcast of roller derby doesn't take place until 1949 at the Polo Grounds in New York. And that's what sort of sparks this idea of like, 
they're sort of on the cutting edge of television and how the sport could be broadcast. And that's where um, a few months later they get, um, I think it's, I can't remember if it's a CBS or an ABC contract. It's in the book. You'll have to look it up, <laughs> um, but where they get that three-year contract. And so it, they would play um, in one location and that would be broadcast out. Um, but after that, when they go in the 1950s, uh, shift over to the West Coast, then they shift over to this different model where they're taping games, sending them out, and they're not broadcasting it live. Um, it was in syndication, and again, the tapes would be sent out. Um, so when it was in the early transcontinental days and they're really hunkering down in places, it was more about newspaper coverage and people seeing it live. They would also do radio programming where they would like it, the broadcast um, from the arena or wherever it is they're playing to try to get the crowd in, but it was more about the live, the, the gate tickets, the receipts, that's how they're making their money, not from the TV. And that again, changes in the 1940s and 50s, and then again in the 1960s with uh, the invention of videotape, essentially. Yeah. And do we see it still broadcast today? I don't have cable anymore. And so <laughs> watch yeah, it. Who does? <laughs> um, but yeah, so no, not in the same sense. So there is, uh, there are streaming channels for roller derby and occasionally you'll see ESPN um, pick it up. Also, I don't really know what the situation is right now at the tail end of the pandemic because that really um, disrupted uh, leagues practicing and playing, obviously. And I think that folks are just now getting back into that. Um, and so again, you would get an occasional broadcast on like a cable channel, but not like, not like it was in the 40s um, or, or even through the 60s. Um, but that's also because it's currently an amateur sport and it's not professional. And that's sort of been a debate throughout um, the community um, in terms of like, is that something we would even wanna do, like go to the Olympics or become professional? And I just saw someone pop up in the chat that there's like streaming on certain channels. And I do think that that is true, but again, not just like regularly programmed or like, an NCAA basketball game, you know, is on Saturday afternoons or whatever. Yeah. We've got a great question here. You mentioned um, some of the, the theatrics or, or some of the spectacle of the sport included, you know, naming conventions. Um, Danny says, over the last few, dear, last few years, I've seen more skaters dropping the punny and creative names and using their own names. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about the trend in the early stages through through now as much as you can about naming conventions of the players. Yeah, so when I first started playing, which would have been like 2009-ish, um, there was even some movement away from that at that time. And it's really pushed away from that in the last few years as I understand it. But what happened when the, the resurgence came in like 2001 is that roller derby was countercultural. It was like cutting edge. And some people were like afraid to let their employers know that they were doing this or they were afraid there'd be repercussions. Um, and so the, the derby names, one was sort of a spun outlet of creating an alter ego and like being whoever you wanted to be when you're skating, right? Like I'm gonna wear hot pants and fishnets or whatever I want and take on this, you know, alter ego derby name and be fun. Um, but then as the sport grew and as time sort of passed um, and it became sort of more, serious, and I don't want to say that it wasn't serious in the beginning, um, but as it became more competitive, maybe, um, there's there was a push by, I think, a certain segment within the roller derby community of, like, we want to sort of be a little bit more legitimate, and so we want to wear uniforms. We want to just skate with our last names, um, and so there's still sort of that tension, I think, within the sport of, like, hanging on to that a little bit of countercultural feel, punk rock, do-it-yourself, you know, ethos to, like, whoa, we're really good athletes and we want to be taken seriously in ways that maybe we weren't in the past. And so there's sort of that grappling between the two, I think. Yeah. So I've got kind of two, two sets of questions. One, one set is going to be more about you and your experience. And then mm -hmm. one is in, in true historian fashion, yeah. looking into the future and, and seeing if we can identify trends from the past. So we'll start with you. What how did you find your information? Where was the research at for, for this topic? And how did you even begin finding information yeah. on the history of roller derby? Yeah. And I think I saw that question come in from Bob Burrow. So, so thank you for that. Um, 
so on one hand, I, like I said uh, early on in the program, I'm an, I'm an oral historian by training and women's women athlete stories have largely been left out of mainstream media and sports coverage. So I wanted to hear from the female skaters themselves. I wanted to know what their experiences were, and I wanted to do full-length oral history interviews with them. So through my Derby network, I was able to connect with a lot of skaters, like famous stars that had skated in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, um, or even into the 60s and 70s too, um, like really big names uh, that, that and just got their stories. And again, their experiences firsthand. Um, I also relied really heavily on um, uh, newspaper coverage, which I am like blown away at, at how many more newspapers have been digitized since I started this research. Like sometimes it's like, oh, technology. I could have found so much more because when I was really, what had been digitized when I started the project was like New York Times, Chicago Tribune. Um, um, some of the other um, like uh, San Francisco papers, things like that. And so um, there's so much more coverage out now, but um, so just seeing how the roller derby was covered in the sports pages of the newspapers. So I relied on that. The other thing is that roller derby themselves had some publications. They had a publication called roller derby news that was like a monthly that came out that would give feature stories on the skaters and all sorts of information. Now, on one hand, I had to take that with a grain of salt because it was promotional at the same time. Um, so like whether things are actually true or not is questionable, but it gives you a lot of insight into like how they saw themselves and how they wanted the public to perceive them. Um, so there's a second book in the works. So <laughs> right, of course. Coming. <laughs> yeah, huh? Bethany sure there is. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, so I would say newspaper sources, interviews and, um, and there, there are a handful of collections, like some of the Seltzer documents are at the University of Texas. Um, and, and so there were a handful of archival um, uh, collections I could look at as well. Yeah. So the next question about you and more your experience, as a new skater, what was most helpful to you when learning to skate? And what was your impression of the league that you trained with culturally? Yeah, so... That's such a great question. Do we have an hour? Because I would really like to just talk about that for a long time. Um, so, I mean, I didn't know how to skate when I joined and I am a lifelong athlete. And what was fascinating to me though, is like those skills didn't translate. Like it didn't matter that I had played college basketball or had done these other things. Like you put eight wheels on your feet, like that just doesn't go well. Like it, I didn't have any background in skating. So um, I, what I really did love about my league though, was they trained you. You did not have to show up and try out because some of the more premier leagues I mean, at that time, there were already levels of like who was in, you know, top level lift it up and um, sorry, the Women's Flat Track Derby Association and others. And, and mine was sort of a middling league where they took on novice skaters that had never skated and trained. And then eventually you were put on teams and went in. And so um, I had personal coaches that would help me through so I could work my way up to be on a team. Um, there was no way I could have just shown up and like to a New York team or even Indianapolis at that point in time. Um, Naptown was uh, bigger. Um, but after I skated, I skated a couple of times with the Circle City girls um, and, and, well, and the uh, men's team here um, in the summer, just a handful of times. But um, so they taught me to do that. So I really needed that. Like I needed it. And that helped me learn the ins and outs of the historic sport too, like from the scratch, because I, you know, was was starting from scratch as well. Um, I feel like there was a second part to that question. Uh, what was the culture of, of your league like? Yeah, so it was, um, it was interesting because it was a co-ed league um, and I had never like played with men before, but they were very open and accepting and inclusive. Um, so we had um, men and women, we had non-binary skaters, we had transitioning skaters, um, and skated against other people of, of different genders and again, uh, transgendered skaters too. So um, we were very inclusive. They were an, had two owners of the league, but it was split 50-50 and then evolved into a nonprofit um, organization as well. So it was very much still the do-it-yourself ethic. Like we had to, to show up and put down the skate, the, put down the flooring before our bouts, everything we did ourselves too. And I had never, that was a really important experience for me too, because I I want to show up and be like, oh, 
shouldn't this all be set up and shouldn't the refs be here and do that? Like, no, we did that ourselves. Everything we did ourselves. And I've never been involved in a sport where that was the case before. And so um, that was a really great experience for me um, being involved in sort of this like grassroots project um, at the same time that it was a sport. Yeah. So, so my last kind of set of questions here, they're, they're all kind of along the same thing of, of the future of roller derby. Um, do you think that we'll see a similar decline now that it's been around 20 years since the resurgence? Does the sport have more staying power now? Do we see broadcast or the Olympics in the future? What, what do you think the future of roller derby looks like now? And do we need to return to theatrics to make it, <laughs> yeah. make it stay? Uh, um, that is such a hard question to answer. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. And then all the thoughts that I had about that were thrown out the wayside with the pandemic. And so I feel like um, the next couple of years will be really interesting to see how things develop be because of the pandemic. And that just put a hold on everything. But of course, not just roller derby, all sports really too. Um, but there was such momentum sort of prior to the pandemic um, in, in the sport grew so fast. I think skaters, um, you know, thought, well, like this will, of course, will go on forever. And, and it's expanding so rapidly and it's everywhere and everyone knows about it now. And everyone has a story related to roller derby. And I think, of course, that's going to naturally level out to some extent. I already know, like, there's been a ton of leagues that have started and folded and closed. Like, and that's going to, again, sort of be a natural progression. But I think where the real issue is with roller derby going forward is um, does it want to sort of hold on to its grassroots DIY e ethos of being an amateur sport or does it want to sort of professionalize? Does it want to join the Olympics? Does it want to have a balance between the two? And there's a, at least before the pandemic, there was a great split um, amongst leagues and skaters themselves just of what the future would hold and the dangers that that would um, bring. So, um, you know, I, I think the next couple of years will be really interesting to see how things develop and, and if that has shifted one way or the other. Um, and if we can sort of pick back up on some of that momentum that, you know, unfortunately was lost during the pandemic. But Roller derby skiers are a hardy group of people, and I have no doubt that they will be able to pull it back together um, if they so choose. Yeah, my, my final question before I pass it back over to John to wrap us up for tonight. Do you see yourself back out on the track? I would love to. It is a great, a great sport. It is a great workout. Um, but I am definitely 40 years old now, um, which I don't, I've only been that for two weeks and I'm struggling with that a little bit, um, and no, have a bum <laughs> diabetic woman. I think you can do it. <laughs> I know. And have a, a bum knee from roller derby, but, uh, I am an athlete at heart. And as soon as we get off here, I'm going to go play basketball. And I think that roller derby could very much be in my future again. You've got a lot of great support in the chat. Um, and of course, Anna, I can't believe we forgot. What was your derby name? I am very classy, obviously. Um, my roller derby name was Coors Lightning. And there's a little bit of a funny story behind that. I'll just share really quickly. But um, when I started skating, of course, we were in Western Massachusetts and very much a college town and was right on the cusp of everybody being super obnoxious about breweries and brewing and try the IPA and I just don't have any patience for that and I'm a Coors Light girl through and through and so that is where my name came from. <laughs> I love that that is such a great story to end on. Michelle this has been wonderful thank you so much I mean I learned so much through the book but I feel like I've learned even more just through this conversation and other conversations we've had if you haven't purchased the book yet, please go purchase it. You will not regret this purchase. Um, and, and stay tuned. Maybe we'll have Michelle back. You've got several calls for just a happy hour on your roller derby experience alone. So well, I'm in. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you all for attending. I really, really appreciate it. Of course. John, the floor is back to you. All right, that was such an amazing program. Um, it's funny how you can just read the book and just review a lot of research, but really just hearing from, um, from just our guest about how wonderful the program is and how it changed over the years. Um, I'd like to thank our moderator, Bethany. Thank you for uh, handling all of like, the questions tonight. Uh, and I'd like to thank you, Dr. Michelle Marino. Um, if you'd like to learn more about roller derby, check out her book called Roller Derby, History of an American Sport, 
from University of Texas Press. I know we peppered the link in throughout the uh, chat box tonight, but we um, don't worry. We'll also be sending out in a follow-up email tomorrow morning. Um, and if you enjoyed this program, I hope you consider coming back for more. Uh, as I mentioned at the top of the program, our next History Happy Hour is on April 7th, where we will talk with Emiliano Aguilar on Hispanic influence on Northern Indiana. Uh, we've also got some other great events coming up from the Indiana Historical Society. You can learn more about these at www.indianahistory.org slash visit slash calendar. We'll post this conversation to the IHS YouTube channel and to our website in the upcoming weeks. In the meantime, if you'd like to visit any of our previous free programs, you can check them out at the History Happy Hour playlist on YouTube or at the link in the chat. Uh, and that link, which I will put over right now. Um, Uh, and if you missed your chance and you would like to donate or you'd like to make a further gift to support the Indiana Historical Society, please visit um, indianahistory.org slash contribute slash donate. Your donation will help us share other Hoosier stories just like this one. Uh, you will get an email from us tomorrow morning with all these links and a survey included. It will take around one minute to complete and we'd love to know what you thought of tonight's program and how we can make all of our programs better. Uh, once again, thank you to our guests and thank you to the audience. I hope you all stay safe and healthy and I hope you have a wonderful St. Patrick's Day. All right, thank you. Have a great evening. <laughs>